Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to part 35 in our series on libraries and recovery. Um, this all began, as you, many of you know, in March, uh, around the question of what is a library if the building is closed? A question that we've never had to ask before, never had, much less had to answer. Uh, and that has led to a whole series of related topics and discussions like internet access and digital services, physical materials and, and social infrastructure, these, these really important services and roles that libraries play in their communities. And that has led us all over the place uh, in, in terms of topics and guests. Uh, we've had nearly 4,000 registrations for this series. Uh, we've had over uh, 80 excellent speakers. We have three more today. You're going to be delighted to hear them. And um, uh, so we're we're rolling now into 2021. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, an open collaboration of, of libraries using technology in interesting, innovative ways. Uh, and our partner, uh, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, headquartered in The Hague, uh, the Hague, or however you say that, uh, and uh, uh, Stephen Weiber there at the controls in the Netherlands, recording and uh, hosting the Zoom. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, we have a session sponsor, which is the DC chapter of the Internet Society. Thank you, DC chapter. And also a series sponsor, Adapt, from an equipment maker that uh, provides uh, TV white space equipment that libraries are using to extend access. Uh, we've got an, a superb lineup today uh, with, uh, we'll, we'll get to the introductions in, in more detail and we'll ask our speakers to say a little bit more about themselves, but, but Pam Ryan joining us from uh, the Toronto Public Library where we're going to hear about their program in education and awareness on AI. Uh, Richard Witt, uh, former head of public policy for Google in DC and then uh, uh, now in residence with Mozilla Foundation as a scholar and importantly, the president of the GLIA Foundation, which is what we're gonna hear about today and, and Richard's idea about how libraries might play an important role in mediating this, this dilemma that we're all in. Uh, and uh, David Lankis is back uh, again to help us uh, make sense of all this. David heads the iSchool at the University of South Carolina. Welcome to you all. Um, of course, our context for this is COVID, uh, as it has been from day one. Uh, we're not going to get too much into that. You know, I've shown graphs. Everybody's kind of, you know, hip, I guess, to the, the running current daily disaster that is this pandemic. Uh, and it's both better and worse. You know, we've got vaccines uh, and we've got more cases and more deaths and, and there's really no end in sight. Uh, just for our view, we think this is going to last a very long time. Some variation of it. Uh, how it, it's amazing there is even a vaccine at all. You know, instead of taking four or five years, or even never, there's no vaccine for HIV. For example, they've done something really phenomenal, and yet uh, the virus is extremely uh, adaptive. And we'll just see how that all goes. But hang on, and we'll keep tracking it. Uh, just want to touch on on kind of our advocacy right now. There's an open window with the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC in the U.S. around this emergency broadband uh, concern. Uh, our position on that is uh, that that the E-rate program, which subsidizes connectivity to uh, schools and libraries, uh, should in fact be modified to accommodate the reality that school is not the building. School is the community of learners wherever they may be. And using that uh, resource to connect those learners and administrators and teachers uh, is the purpose of that fund. And likewise with libraries uh, as part of the educational ecosystem uh, need to be accommodated and also uh, allow uh, connectivity beyond the walls, as we're saying. This is basically a simple graph of, of a, a library that's serving as a base station using wireless to connect remote locations. Uh, this is a slide out of uh, uh, a project in Nebraska where the uh, uh, upper 
right hand dot is a school that has fiber gigabit connectivity and then the lower left is Plymouth Nebraska four miles away a town of 400 people with 46 students and they have sucky broadband in little Plymouth so what they have done here is shoot a, a half a gigabit wireless microwave connection to a water tower in Plymouth and then you can see the pop out in the middle of the screen uh, where they're spreading that uh, to four uh, library locations in this little town so that's cool that that really didn't cost very much we funded that for under twenty thousand dollars and and now people in this town have connectivity we need to do this everywhere uh these stations can be in playgrounds or uh in this case they can be portable that case on the on the right is a is a portable unit that one of our projects uh developed as a as a, a pop-up station uh, that they use to support a uh, not not a disaster like a, a hurricane or a flood, but actually a civic event. This is a marathon race that they were providing extra connectivity to. A lot of places don't have adequate cell coverage uh, or, or a phone booth. This is uh, in Georgia. They're repurposing old phone booths to be these uh, stations. Uh, or in the case of one uh, project, they they moved it over to support a, uh, a, a testing site. Um, there's no reason not for these things to be everywhere. Even, even uh, with, you know, populated. Why not a, a pop-up spot with a, with a librarian, you know, checking in in a neighborhood? We basically, it, and of course, what what is the basis of these? They may have materials. They may they may do all sorts of things, but what anchors their functionality is library Wi-Fi, not just public Wi-Fi, but access to library digital services one of which is the open internet, but there are others, all the, all the digital materials, all the digital services uh, that libraries provide, the databases, and even a librarian. So that's the thing that makes it different and special and the thing that so many people depend on. 80, roughly 80 million people accessed these, that service at libraries uh, before the pandemic, 80 million. And so now they're either outside of the parking lot or you know what, they're, they're just not. So our case is every neighborhood should have one of these library outlets, uh, 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 an access station, if you will, as, as a fixed wireless uh, resource. Everyone should be within easy uh, access uh, distance of, of such a, such a, uh, a unit in, you know, in a public location. Think uh, a combination of uh, public phone, emergency call box, uh, e-government kiosk, a mailbox, and, and library access. All of that, you know, in one unit that just, and these maybe cost any, you can set these up anywhere from 500 to a couple of thousand dollars. So think how valuable that will be and think how many we could have for not much money. We spend billions of dollars every year on, on E-rate connectivity. We could set a hundred thousand of these up for, you know, a hundred million, a couple of hundred million tiny fraction of the of the e-rate and so that's our that's our pitch right now to the fcc is to allow that allow libraries to do that so back to the program at hand here so we're gonna we're gonna start with uh david uh who's gonna set us up and uh he's also written about ai and then we'll uh, hear from pam and richard uh this is a i i plucked this out of the the uh, Urban Libraries Council uh, brief on, on AI, which I hope everyone had a chance to read. It's, it's an excellent uh, summary of the situation and the opportunity and these, these roles for libraries, which, you know, this is really important. This is our, kind of our case here is, you know, what, what can libraries do? What, what, how can libraries help their communities deal with this onslaught of, of technology? I mean, we've created this miracle thing it's doing so much for us at the same time, it's kind of addictive. <laughs> and addictions always lead to doom. So we're, we're in you know, the classic rock and the hard place. Uh, we, we cannot do without the conveniences and the benefits, and yet the technology is just taking us over. Uh, so here we go. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to David, and welcome back, David. Thank you for uh, being here and, and helping us make sense of this. Uh, take it away. 
Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I'm, I think I'm invited to this because I am now, I think, the official library cranky person. I don't know. Um, but I'm, my, my goal in, in today is to listen uh, much more than talk. So I'll just give a quick sort of setting the stage, and then I will, I will be quiet and learn alongside the rest of you. It's interesting when we talk about, you know, when, when Don presents a very compelling vision for how we can be connecting the, the world and connecting the internet. And at the same time, I think a lot of time as librarians, we look at the positive side of that, providing connectivity, providing access, um, providing a way of communicating to each other. But we have to realize that increasingly, um, there's a dark side to that. I mean, we, as we talk about libraries connecting people to the internet, many for-profit companies are also seeking to provide free or open access to the internet, and they're doing it for a very different reason. They're using it for monetizing and bringing things about. And so we need to spend some time being aware of what's happening and finding out if we're comfortable with it and setting it up. So just quickly in terms of setting the stage, uh, move my mouse over here. Uh, one of the things that, that in the discussion that we're having around artificial intelligence is I've talked with students and librarians and folks around the area, it seems like this big, massive thing. And so it's almost too hard to get our hands around. As I say, we're going to hear today about people who are making that exception and bringing it to folks. But I think part of the reason we, are, we have an issue with this is because we conflate many things together. And when you conflate those together from massive infrastructure, from data, et cetera, it seems big. And we automatically sort of sit back and go, well, that's a technology thing for trillion dollar valuation companies to take care of. And I think that, that it's really clear that in fact, if we look at the bits and pieces, we're going to see a lot of things we can do. I mean, just back to that idea of connectivity and, and being aware of what we're doing, an earlier story. When libraries, and this is, maybe seven years ago, not very long ago, when libraries looked to increase their e-access to e-books, e-resources, et cetera, public libraries, academic libraries in particular, looked for tools that they could use to distribute electronic texts. And so many of them went out and said, we're not gonna build our own. We're going to go buy and purchase ones that make sense. And a lot of them chose uh, e-reader software from Adobe. Um, and the issue is that Adobe said, we can provide this capability, we can provide copyright clearance, we can provide you know, pirating, all of these things. And libraries said, that's great. And libraries at the same time were saying, this is an ebook solution for you. We still bring all our values to this, which we'll talk about in a minute. We're, we're still looking at how we can provide equitable access without monitoring. And they really pushed up this idea that once again, you're reading the ebook, but we're not watching what you're reading or how you're reading it. But it turns out Adobe was. It turns out that um, as some good librarians got in and began looking at something strange, which is when you started into an ebook, the Adobe software kept sending back messages back to the mothership of Adobe. And um, they were sending it in clear text, which means anyone could have intercepted it. And in fact, they were sending what's being read, by whom, page by page, how long. This is to me a, a real cautionary tale for AI, which is there can be an enthusiasm and there's amazing things and positive things that AI has brought to us in the world and that I think libraries need to participate in. But we also have to educate ourselves to make sure that we are not simply reifying someone else's agenda or cutting our values out because we see this as somehow different or technology wise. So I want to just quickly think about a way of breaking down the current discussions around AI, because you'll see it, for example, in The Social Network, which is a fabulous documentary. You'll see this in a lot of discussions, which is there's a lot of things being pushed together under this, this heading. And for me, it, it, it's helpful to break it down into parts and pieces, because we are experiencing now a revolution and, and a massive quantum leap forward in the capabilities of artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence has been something we've worked on since the 1950s. And if you look at what's driving this massive new push, it's actually not the algorithms or the coding or even the, the computing capability. It's the wide scale availability of data to crunch on. It's changed how we look at AI and what we can do with AI. So the biggest thing when we're talking about artificial intelligence, we have to realize that much of what we're talking about is built on a foundation of readily accessible data. 
Um, that data is coming from the digital trail that we are sometimes and oftentimes unconsciously leaving as we're shopping on the internet, using our phones, using our digital devices, connecting however we are, we're giving away a lot of data. And I think what's interesting is a lot of times we don't think of ourselves as publishers and producers, and yet now everyone is a publisher and a producer of data, but because we don't think of it that way, we often give it away, don't pay attention to it, or don't worry about it. So there's a whole host of issues when you're talking about the data that we're providing and who's providing, how we're providing an education that we can provide. On top of the data, then there's this notion of algorithms. And I break this down from the, the, what I'll talk about in a moment, which are different computing approaches to artificial intelligence. This is just the idea that, our, that we're using this data in all different means and forms from who shows up on your Facebook timeline to who gets uh, a loan from a bank to who gets a job. These algorithms are taking this wide scale availability of data, running them through systems, and then coming up with results, often without transparency. One of the, the if you're looking for books to read, I just cannot recommend Kathy O'Neill's um, Weapons of Math Destruction more. She goes through a lot of these different algorithms, how they use data, and come up with contrary results and often biased results. We see this all the time in the idea of a lot of built-in assumptions that, that we think for a moment of code is this objective set of procedures, but it's often a representation of worldview and biases that we currently have encoded into these systems. So that's another thing we can look at. Um, and then the last level, which really is the one that I think most deserves this focus around AI, which is moving from sort of algorithms and predictive programming to machine learning and particularly things like deep learning. Um, as I say, AI has been a, a quest of folks since the 1950s uh, when we had the early technology. Um, and so, I mean, the classic, let's face it, library love story tale that we all have to show to our first year students is, uh, is, is Hepburn and Tracy's uh, desk set. And that was really looking at a big computer as an AI system. Uh, but the approaches we're taking were things like frame set, the idea of coming up with scripts, the idea of sort of coming up with some algorithms that would try and predict based on data. But what was happening is we'd always find a way to break them. You'd always have a script, you'd find a way to break them. And so what's now been introduced is this nota, notion of machine learning and particularly deep learning. Machine learning through things like um, entailment meshes and different forms of, I'm sorry, I'm suddenly blanking on all my terminology, but how we could take uh, neural nets, thank you, Neural nets, where what we do is we say, well, all right, here are all the x-rays that indicate signs of breast cancer. This is your training set. Learn on this training set, then we'll start putting in data. And there's a huge amount of upfront tutoring that has to go into these kinds of algorithms, the idea of building test sets. Deep learning says, actually, given enough data, um, because now we can talk instead of hundreds and thousands, we can talk about it in millions and billions of instances, the machine can actually come up with things we never thought about. And we can take out this really expensive and hard effort of machine learning and go just to the idea of doing some correction, modeling, Markov models, all these different forms where we can do this. This is a fundamentally different approach to artificial intelligence because it can drive all the data that we sort of leave lying around um, consciously or unconsciously to come up with new approaches. And it's having marvelous effects, whether those are positive or negative, what you're marveling at, that's where we, we come in. But everything from search engines that are seem to know more about what we're looking for than we do, to the idea of predictive algorithms and lots of, you know, talking to Surrey and talking to your, your AI uh, choice, the idea we're implementing business practices. We're looking now, for example, about the creation of metadata and cataloging through artificial intelligence. There are really great things that's happening, but it's based on this fundamentally different approach. And that's why what happens, we often conflate these together. And so we look at this as a big, how do I take all of this on? And we get a bit lost. But if we begin to break it down, we have different roles to play. And we'll be hearing some about those today. So I just want to be uh, keep us on time. And so the last thing I'll do is just give you some priming thoughts as we have this conversation. First of all, as I look at, once again, recommend the social, um, the social dilemma, 
we often think of uh, AI and we think of, we talk about data use by Facebook and by these different systems as they're collecting and selling our data. And I, you know, I used to use that terminology as well. And the truth is Facebook has no interest in selling data. They wanna keep it all for themselves. What they're selling is certainty of engagement. They're selling, if you want to target, we can target a very specific person. We have different mechanisms to make sure they pay attention. And we can begin to be certain about whether that's going to turn into a purchasing decision, whether that's going to turn into a voting decision, whether that's going to turn into an action, all of those things. So these companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, are selling not your data. They're using your data to sell certainty. And uh, certainly comes with a lot of things about how we manipulate dopamine cycles and things of that nature. Second thing I think we need to worry about, and we'll hear more about this, is that right now our data scheme is that we give our data and they're housed individually in these different, whether they're commercial, non-commercial governmental agencies, and they control and seem to own our data. And we need to begin to think much more about, you know, this idea that if we did this for money, we wouldn't have one currency, we'd have you know, a money, a purchasing system for our uh, grocery store and for our clothing store and for Amazon, and they would control our money and they would tell us what we could do. Or, you know, that sounds absurd. And yet that's what we're doing with our data, that you have to log into all these different places to try and find your data and then ask whether you can use it the way you intend it. Um, lo um, locating expertise within the ecosystem. One conversation we have to have is does every librarian need to be an AI expert? Do we need a few of them? Do we need many of them? And does it sit within our libraries, within some consortium, whether it's within vendors or whether it's in partners? We need to think about that. As for my call of action, the, the last thing I will say, and then I will shut up, is that we need to be part of this conversation. We can't ignore massive scale data. and We can't explore, uh, ignore artificial intelligence because we need to ensure that the values represented by our discipline are represented in this conversation. Learning openness, for example. These, you know, these machine learning systems are coming up with predictive models. Can we audit them? Can we understand what they're doing and how? Intellectual honesty, that we need to understand that there are encoded biases and approaches and how do we deal with those, make them apparent, make them obvious. We have to deal with intellectual freedom and safety issues. Who gets to use the data? How do they get to use data? And how can we continue to allow people to explore brand new ideas when once again, they're creating these data trails along the way. And finally, diversity. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not only in terms of our collection, but we know that you can build in machine learning can quickly be turned into racist, racist chatbots and AI powered hand dryers that don't work with black skin. This idea of how do we ensure that AI is beneficial to all of our communities, not just the communities that have a lot of money or education to particularly tackle this issue. So there you go. I, I turn it back over to many smarter people than I, and I shut up and learn. Wow. Uh, fantastic, David. Just, just what I was hoping for. Uh, you've helped set us up because what our objective today is not to cover all of these aspects in depth, but to at one point do a survey of the various aspects as a setup to follow on sessions. We, we think this is the beginning of a thread around this topic that we're going to have a number of, of sessions focusing on these various aspects, you know, all of which you mentioned are really important. So it's just so big, it's so pervasive a thing that we have to break it up to tackle it. And so what's triggered me, I think, is uh, uh, around privacy. And, you know, just me, but that's what I'm, I'm kind of feeling besieged by, uh, you mentioned voting. So I live in a little town of 7,000 people. We had a, a city council race in November. One of the councilmen bought, you know, ads. And I, I went to her ad site. So she had my, you know, my, my stuff. And I started seeing ads for this councilman candidate everywhere I went. You know, the front page of the New York Times, there she is smiling at me. And I'm going, wait, every, I must have been, you know, exposed like 20 times to this ad. And I, and I, so I, I wrote her a note. I said, well, how much do I cost? How much did I cost you to do that? I mean, if it were a billboard, it would have been less effective than having it right there for, you know, and she didn't know. She just contracted somebody to do it for her. So this is, this is powerful stuff. I mean, all the way from that is a kind of a micro issue to will AI help us solve global warming? Is it our only hope to solve global warming? 
And you also make me think maybe we need, uh, 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 you said, you know, how would we kind of handle this knowledge in the library world? Maybe we need an AI on AI in the library world. We'll see. Okay, uh, on to uh, Pam. Welcome, Pam. Uh, you were uh, introduced to us by uh, Stephen Abram there in Canada, who who put us through to the program. You, uh, your your library was also highlighted in the Urban Library Council brief that I hope everybody read. And, and thank you, Urban Library Council, for helping uh, promote this. Uh, are you ready to go, Pam? We're ready for you. I am. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm just going to set this deck up. How are we looking? Good. Good. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from snowy, cold Toronto. Um, happy to, to be here today and uh, hoping to learn uh, a lot more from, from the rest of the conversation. I'm going to set up um, my discussion here about Toronto Public Library's digital privacy initiatives by uh, starting off by talking about how they're grounded in our, our strategic and partnership framework and a little bit about why libraries, why are libraries doing this, public libraries. I'll talk about our digital privacy initiative and then uh, a little more specificity around our algorithmic literacy programs. So as foundation to where this sits, um, TPL strategic plan is, of course, our commitment to building success and resilience and well-being for our city. We have five strategic priorities up here on the screen. Um, and the second is digital inclusion and literacy. So access to technology, the skills to navigate and use it are critical for all Torontonians to be successful and connected and well, particularly right now when we're all uh, locked in and it is one of our only connections to, to the world. So, but while technology and the internet, we all know are available, they can be expensive um, and ways to understand and use them are not always easy to access. Our digital privacy initiative, uh, it is grounded in working to offer programs and services to help Torontonians have the digital skills they need to succeed in the digital world. And you'll see in this model too, that all of our strategic priorities are considered through an equity lens. David had mentioned the importance of this and uh, we certainly are on board with that. We're committed to helping level the playing field for all Torontonians with a particular focus on equity seeking groups and vulnerable populations uh, to help break down the barriers to access and increasing inclusion for everyone so they feel welcome and represented in our spaces, whether that's online or, or in our branches and able to access those services and can benefit from the outcomes we're trying to drive with these initiatives. I want to highlight too, uh, the bottom of the screen, the partnerships. Uh, we have three enablers to make our strategic priorities um, possible and partnerships have been key in enhancing our capacity uh, to ensure that our digital privacy programs are both informed by and or delivered by industry or academic experts. From the city level, in June of 2019, the city of Toronto became a signatory on the Declaration for Cities for Digital Rights. And as part of that adoption and in recognition of the work that TPL had already done in this area, City Council funded us a new permanent position to be dedicated to the creation of programming to further digital safety and literacy in support of the Declaration's five principles. I'll highlight the first three because they, they really are those that speak the most to our digital privacy programs. So university and, and equal access to the internet and digital literacy. Uh, the principle here is that everyone should have access to affordable and accessible internet and digital services on equal terms, as well as the digital skills to make use of these and overcome the digital divide. For the second, privacy, data protection and security. Principle here is that everyone should have privacy and control over their personal information through data protection in both physical and virtual places to ensure digital confidentiality, security, dignity, anonymity and sovereignty over their data including the right to know what happens to their data, who uses it and for what purposes. And then the third, transparency, accountability and non-discrimination of data content and algorithms. This is the principle that everyone should have access to understandable and accurate information about the technological, algorithmic and artificial intelligence systems that impact their lives and the ability to question and change unfair or biased or discriminatory systems. And then why libraries? Don already highlighted this. This is the, the item from the leadership brief, Libraries Leading AI and Digital Citizenship. And it really just sets the stage as this is the work we do. 
we're trusted our communities, we help our, our uh, communities understand information, and this is just a piece of that. So in terms of our digital privacy initiative, we launched it in 2016 with the aims to empower Torontonians with the knowledge and confidence they need to navigate digital spaces without compromising their privacy and security. I'll give a brief overview of some of the programs and services so you get a, a flavor of what the kinds of things public libraries can be doing to support their communities. So overall, our initiative has included a series of branch and online programs, a Tor browser project, a digital privacy expo that brought together experts to discuss data and personal security. We had an interactive art installation. We have an instructional video series. And then some of the initiatives focused more on, art, on algorithmic literacy have included uh, workshops to help users understand the complexities of online environments, some hands-on programs with do-it-yourself machine learning kits, speaker series, stakeholders forums. I'm gonna run through a few examples. So I just want to highlight here, um, you can see this is our, our uh, uh, promotional uh, material for our, our programming. And you can see how digital privacy uh, is right there in, in, in the top corner. Like this is core for what we're doing. It's up there with our story times and our environmental programming and our, our children's programming. Um, so we really do, um, we really do focus on, uh, on, on making sure it's, it's, it's front and center. Probably our core program is a recurring four courses over four weeks in a digital privacy series. So they focus on hands-on, in-person, we've done a few online since the pandemic, uh, that covers how to better understand the threats and myths uh, about online security, knowing how to strengthen your computer and online security. Um, the programs uh, that we've done with external presenters have included speakers from organizations like the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, Privacy, Surveillance and Technology Project, the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and other leading academics and legal scholars. And the range of topics that we've provided are things like privacy and freedom, cyber attacks and digital privacy, privacy rights, user privacy on the web, and then in 2018, uh, the Tor browser was installed on uh, TPL Learning Center computers. These are the computers we use for our in-person computer instruction courses. Um, I'm sure most on the, on the call know that the Tor browser is a free and open source web browser that anonymizes your web traffic using the Tor network. Uh, so it makes it easy to protect your identity online. Our intention is that in order to help people understand the tools that are out there to protect uh, themselves online against tracking and surveillance and censorship, that we need the tools in our libraries available to be able to train them on. Um, we've taken a, a number of questions about this and uh, I have a number of libraries across the, the US in particular say, how can you even do this? Uh, but we do. And uh, Part of our four week digital privacy course includes instruction on, on the Tor browser and how to download it on your on your personal computer or devices. Uh, this initiative did win a 2019 uh, American Library Association Award for Innovative International Library Project. Um, in partnership with Tor and the Citizen Lab at the U of T, Toronto, and the Digital Justice Lab, we hosted a full day in person Digital Privacy Expo. We had over 340 people attend. Uh, and we had sessions on privacy and security, your privacy and, and the law in Canada, uh, spyware, spyware, malware, you know, a good, a good mix of, of uh, experts and uh, a great one day session. This is one of my favorite things. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Glass Room Initiative. It's uh, the Glass Room Experience. It's a temporary rotating interactive art installation by Mozilla and tacticaltech.org. And it really helps, uh, you know, make real in a hands-on way, um, exploring how companies and mechanisms that make our everyday technology and their connection to Internet of Things. So participants were invited to play fake or real to see how smart they were in knowing about the world of smart devices. So um, some focus here on our artificial intelligent programs. Um, they began in 2019 and we've had over 35 uh, so far uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic period. We've had seven online. This is a list of some of the courses that, that we've developed uh, in-house. 
I think the core one at the top, the algor algorithmic literacy one, understanding algorithms and bias, um, is the, the key course we offer. And it's par in it, participants uh, explore how decision making algorithms uh, affect their experience online. And they learn about algorithmic bias and how decision making uh, algorithms can have negative con consequences. Uh, we have a couple of hands on uh, courses that we offer too. So that the two do it yourself ones. Uh, one's on image recognition, and it's where participants explore the foundations of machine learning using Google's uh, AIY vision kit. Uh, they get hands on with, you know, uh, the weighted algorithms and the mechanics of image recognition, and they try to answer the question, can a computer tell how you are feeling? And then um, the voice recognition uh, session, participants explore the foundations of machine learning using Google's AIY voice kit and they train Google's voice assistant to their voice to see how it learns. Uh, they're just, you know, uh, easy to do hands on things that really help explain uh, what's going on for people. And then just with the as with the digital privacy programs, it's been critical for us to have external experts and programs to bring their expertise uh, to to uh, Torontonians through through TPL. We've had external presenters uh, present on the topics on the screen. And the representatives have been from the Open News Network, from Open Data with the City of Toronto, numerous University of Toronto researchers from law and bioethics and computing science, and the Data and Society Research Institute in, North, in uh, North, uh, New York City, as well as a number of authors. I want to highlight one uh, particular program. And this one is a result of one of our partnerships. Uh, we have Toronto Public Library has an innovation council. Uh, it's an advisory group of leading tech and academic and private and public sector leaders that advise us on our programs and services. And in uh, 2020, we started uh, an Innovation Council Presents series where members of our council host programs and bring their networks to our programs. So this example was Women in AI. It's recorded, so the link on the, on the, the slide uh, there can, can bring you right to that. And it was led by our Innovation Council member, Pamela Robertson, who is the, an Associate Dean of Graduate Studies at Ryerson University. And it featured Susie Dunn, who is a PhD candidate and a uh, instructor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa, and uh, Renata Avila, who, who is a Guatemalan international human rights lawyer and author. So they uh, were able to, to you know, sort of highlight that as the use of, of machine learning and advanced computation uh, continues to gain attention, uh, many of the leaders receiving attention are men, and that this uh, panel helped to highlight the work of women leading these issues, uh, as well as some gender and racial bias in AI issues, um, and how we should be approaching AI through a diversity inclusion lens. So that's my quick overview. I'd like to close with encouragement for your libraries to take on similar programming. Uh, TPL is always happy to share curriculum, ideas, whatever we've done. Uh, for you to be able to repurpose and use in your libraries. And I'm happy to uh, to talk further or take any questions offline as well. Wow, that's great, Pam. Uh, what what an amazing array of, of programs you, you've done. Are these all recorded somewhere and available? Um, some are, uh, so, some are, some aren't. Um, the, uh, the in-person program, or sorry, the online programming, we really have only been doing uh, since the start of the, the pandemic in earnest. Uh, we've always sort of recorded our, our big author talk. So some of those will be, be available. Um, but uh, I can certainly provide links to, to what we do have. And uh, as long as, as the pandemic is on, all of our programs are online. So uh, from here forward, <laughs> uh, anybody's able to participate from wherever they are. Great, okay. So Tammy uh, has just posted the link for uh, Women in AI event. That's great. If you have uh, other links that uh, you, you'd like to share now. The, the chat's a good place to do that. Um, you, you touched on so many issues. I, I, I mean, again, we were talking about using this session as a setup to explore these different areas, and you've given us a, a wide uh, range of, of uh, topics that you've already you know, delved uh, into. So we'll be kind of following up and looking at what you've done to help help guide us as we go forward. Um, this, this thing about privacy and you know how we're kind of trading data for convenience, 
you know, the, the devil's bargain, if you will. And, and it's just one corner of this. I, I'm not trying to say that's the only thing, but how people feel about privacy is probably one of the widest ranges of opinion that we've got from some people saying, I don't want anybody to know anything about me to why do I care? <laughs> Actually, I, I want everybody to know everything about me. I'm posting everything I do. I, I, you know, what, what is privacy? What are you talking about? So it's, it's really interesting that, you know, everybody has different ideas about this, uh, uh, this notion of privacy. I ask for questions. Anybody has questions? Okay. Uh, teens from Colleen. Uh, program targeted at, at teens is a really good question because, you know, there's the question of, uh, of kind of house te home technology policy and when do you give a device to your children? You know, in the social dilemma, they say, you know, don't give your kids a phone until they're in high school. And yet we're, we're giving tablets to toddlers by the tens of millions. So uh, there are some questions about this and especially for these formative years. Uh, and, and so what, what do you do for, you know, age groups? Do you have special targeted age groups, Pam? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um... Over the last couple of years, we have worked with the Brookfield Institute, which is um, part of the uh, Ryerson University, to develop a digital literacy series for teens. Uh, and you know, they did a ton of, of research on that, and and uh, we use that curriculum and and continue to iterate on it. So we do have a, uh, a curriculum for specifically for teens that we we are happy to share. Have you learned anything you can kind of generalize about? Uh, well, it runs the full range. Um, there's, uh, it is a, a multi-week series, series um, of programs and uh, they are hands-on. Um, we have done some online since the pandemic, uh, but they, they do focus on things um, that I know many libraries have around um, you know, computer use, but also coding programs, um, some, some web uh, development type programs, but a whole bunch of digital, digital literacy and, and data privacy uh, okay. in there as well. All right. Well, good. Thank you. It was a really wonderful presentation. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time at the end here uh, to have more Q and A. And as I mentioned, you know, we close the recording about on the hour, but then we kind of hang out for open discussion. Uh, anybody's welcome to stay. No one is obligated to stay. So, with that, I'll turn to uh, our final final speaker today, Richard Witt, uh, longtime colleague and uh, leader in uh, infrastructure. Uh, development at every level and has uh, apparently found a, a calling here around this topic. Uh, Richard, one of the things that's come up just to maybe address is the open source AI. It, it came up in the chat, you know. Okay, so these the largest companies in the history of humanity have uh, these troves of data. Every bit, you know, every click is, you know, is there for the harvesting. How how can we as individuals or even in individual institutions kind of match that? And so how? Help us. <laughs> Give us uh, well, first, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Don. And um, yeah, there are, there's a lot of uh, sort of push and pull between proponents of big data and power and those of powerful AI or algorithms. And, um, you know, it, it's become more of a truism that as long as you have a lot of data, you don't necessarily need to have the best cutting edge uh, AI algorithms, deep learning based, machine learning based uh, computational systems to analyze, sift through and provide insights. Um, so, and then others would say, well, no, you really need to have the AIs, you know, at a certain level of competence. So, but I think I'm, I tend to be on the, on the side of, you know, on the data, if you have enough data and it's relevant data, then you don't need to necessarily match what the big guys have. Um, and that to me then is a call to collective action, right? For those of us, of course, who are, quote, the owners of the data, I don't necessarily like that term, but for those from whom the data is being extracted and provided to the platform companies, um, you know, we're in the driver's seat. We actually are the ones who, um, who have some control or at least can, at least theoretically have control over the terms and conditions under which that data is taken from us and then utilized. So if we can figure out a way to collective action and, and my presentation here in about probably 35 seconds or so, we'll, we'll dive into this. Then I think we have a real opportunity to not just take them on 
on their own terms in a sense, but create our own terms where we have AI capabilities and the data flows that match up with our human agency as opposed to matching up to their, their bottom line business models. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, well, again, thank you. Let me uh, switch over, hopefully get my screen going here. This uh, folks can see that. Um, and let me get rid of that. Whoops, cool. Can people, uh, people yes. see that? Great. Well, again, thank you uh, for inviting me here, Don. Um, I've been a big fan of your work for many years. As you know, we've worked together on some of the E-rate related broadband issues at the FCC. So it was, it was heartening to see some of the potential um, advances there and the proposals you all are making to the agency. Very important work there. Um, for those of you who saw The Social Dilemma, uh, I think it does a really nice job of exploring and demonstrating a lot of the, the challenges we have with the web today. I think Tristan Harris and the Center for Humane Technology in particular um, have done a really admirable job pointing out how these technologies actually prey on human weaknesses as opposed to enhancing our, our human strengths. Um, but you also probably noticed, and I certainly came to this at the end of it, a, a sense of, okay, so what do we do about it? Uh, we see the problems fairly clearly here. What are the solutions? Um, and even if you, know, you look at things like GDPR, noticing consent regimes, more data protection laws, more ways of digging into algorithmic bias, it still basically attempts to hold the incumbent platform providers, whether they are companies or governments, a little bit more accountable, a little bit more transparent, but ultimately they are still in control. They're still in charge. And we're trying to do the best we can to, um, you know, to, to sort of challenge their superiority and their sort of dominance over us in terms of data flows and, and AI. And so, you know, keeping oneself on away from the dinner table, sure, that's a nice, nice, um, attempt within the family structure, but that's not gonna create major systemic change. So since I left Google back in May of 2018, I was there for over 11 years as a public policy attorney. Um, I really wrestled with this, this, this challenge. And I've come up with hopefully a couple of quick solutions to run through with you this morning and, hope, and, and the basis for, I would also hope, um, conversations down the road. And this is to say, creating a more decentralized web where more of the power and control and the access is at the edge of the network. So the so-called decentralized web, distributed web, or some of the terms people use around this. Some people talk about blockchain and as sort of an example, which is true, but that's only a technology layer issue or, uh, or potential solution. I've come up with sort of two crucial elements to talk about here and I'll sort of dive into it. First off, this is what we're up against, what I've been calling the seams control cycles. These are feedback loops created by the platform companies very successfully over the past two decades harnessing the power of the web, the client-server relationship. Uh, Sashana Zuboff wrote an amazing book on this in terms of surveillance capitalism. So I'm not saying anything necessarily that different from what she has, but I've tried to encapsulate it in a way that people might find a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more uh, accessible. Um, and, and so I've called this the seam cycle for surveillance. Uh, so basically all the devices, many of them are our devices, at least supposedly our devices in our homes and in our persons, uh, that are surveilling us, the extraction element, the data being taken from us, the content then being delivered to us ultimately on the other end, the analysis, and then manipulation, which when I first thought about this two or three years ago, it seemed like a strong term, uh, but I've had actually no reason now to doubt that that is in fact what's happening. This influence has now shaded over into actual manipulation of our human behaviors. And so that's the part that I think is, is hugely problematic from us from the, the human scale. So my suggestion here, my humble, my humble suggestion, recommendation, is to recapture the web, we have to think about it in human-centric terms. And, and what I've come up with is a way of the paradigm, maybe even a way of sort of framing as a counter to the seams uh, approach, the seam cycles, is what I'm calling hacks. So human autonomy and agency via computational systems. So autonomy, roughly correlating to our sort of freedom of thought, our ability to sort of be in ourselves, to have our private selves, uh, and then agency, our freedom of action in our environments, in our daily lives, our interactions, including on the web. And that the computational system should help enhance this. There shouldn't be things that repress it or take advantage of some of the foibles that we have in our own cognitive systems. It should actually be ways that we can further autonomy and agency. And then the two ways of doing this is really combining two different worlds. The world I come from, public policy, law, 
uh, uh, regulation, et cetera, uh, that we're talking about governance. And so the governance formula here is that the rights we have in the digital context should at least equal what we have in the analog world. And I would suggest there should be greater than. And instead what we see, and we can talk about this in just a second, we actually see we have fewer rights in the digital space. We have less agency and autonomy online than we do in the offline space. Um, that seems hugely problematic to me. Why do we not have at least more, you know, at least the same, if not more? So we need a governance formula that matches up to giving us those kinds of rights. And then the second is then on the technology side, which most of the focus here in Silicon Valley tends to be on. And so the technology design principle I'm suggesting here, we have the end-to-end -end principle, which is the heart and soul of the internet. Um, that is the notion that you keep a lot of the power at either end of the network. Um, that's where the intelligence resides, et cetera. The platform companies, including my previous employer, Google, have done a terrific job, I have to say, in taking that particular end-to-end -end approach. And then they've put all of these sort of the power and control on their side of the platform. So they've, they've really sort of, in my way of thinking, they've taken advantage of the end-to-end -end solution of the internet, um, but not in a way that really advances our interests as human beings. So I propose sort of an overlay to that, which I'm calling E to A, which is edge to any or edge to all. And the edge here is us. We are the so-called so edge of the network. They are the core or the other end of the network. And we have been, you know, we have been the folks, the objects of these seams cycles for many years now. And it's only increasing now moving into the IoT space, smart cities governance, et cetera. We are, we are increasingly uh, continuing to be and, and more uh, over time, the objects of these, these cycles. And so edge to any or edge to all to me is a counter approach to that, to really take that end to end principle and really tilt it, tilt that platform, not just to the middle, to sort of it's more or less neutral, but really tilt it in a way that's decidedly to the advantage of those of us and the edge. Um, I've written an article which is about to be published by the Colorado Technology Law Journal, which goes into more detail here. Uh, the, the title, I think appropriately enough, is called Hacking the Seams. So how do you take this new paradigm to challenge these, these seam cycles? Um, so, uh, so this new governance component, um, I believe should rest on things that we have learned about from our history. And the one that I keep coming back to and I propose for you today is fiduciary law. So fiduciary law has been around for hundreds of years. It's not just the English common law, as many people believe, it really has been seeped into cultures and legal regimes around the globe, which is not surprising because um, as Tamar Frankel, one of the authors and experts in this area puts it, it addresses uneven human relationships or entrusted power. And that of course is a near universal right there. The basic idea is that one person is made vulnerable based on a number of factors entrusting something of value to somebody like the confidence, um, relative differences in expertise, the scope of assigned discretion, and again, the sharing of confidences or personal information. The basic common law duties here are the duty of care, which the Hippocrates, many of us are familiar with from um, physicians, Hippocratic Oath, uh, do no harm. And then loyalty, which is the higher level duty, which is to say, have no conflicts of interest, and that what you're doing is to actually serve the best interests as far as you can ascertain of your client or customer. So there are modern day counterparts in the so-called analog space we're all familiar with, doctors and lawyers, certain kinds of financial advisors, uh, even pharmacists, uh, real estate buyers, brokers, and I would dare to say for today's purposes, librarians. Um, we can talk more about that in, in just a moment. So the idea here is to take that common law conception of fiduciary law, of duties of care and loyalty, um, and trying to address even relationships and introduce that into the digital world, to the web it, particularly, these common law principles. Um, the trust deficits we're seeing are only growing with the seam cycles. How do we counter that? We have to create more trust. The way to build trust is through relationships where there's mutual agreement and understanding. And when that entity that is in a particular power, position of power uh, or control based on expertise and shared confidences, owes those duties and obligations in a very clear manner. So there are certain types of what I'm calling trust mediaries that I believe can promote this paradigm. The first one, the information fiduciaries uh, notion is Jack Balkin from um, Harvard Law School. He wrote some articles about this about four or five years ago. His, uh, his thinking was to mandate the duty of care for all online entities. So anybody who touches my data would have this obligation, this duty of care towards me. Um, I think that's a very important advance, but I frankly think it's, it's incomplete because uh, one, you're imposing a duty on, I think what would, it's fair to say are many, in many cases, 
are unwilling participants in that regime. And second, it's a duty of care, it's not loyalty. And so what I've proposed and suggest here is what I'm calling digital fiduciaries. So opting into loyalty uh, with what I'm calling a digital life support system. There's a lot of detail here we won't go into today, but that would be a, a duty of loyalty, but it's an opt-in where the entity is willing to accept those obligations and duties because either they see a public purpose for it or there's some basic commercial relationship that could be established that satisfies both sides. Those are sort of the ones trained on individuals or other types of fiduciary obligations trust mediaries, the last two that are listed here that are more communal, that are based on the collective pooling of data. One is called the Data Trust. Uh, Sylvia Delacroix uh, from the UK has done some amazing research around this area. And then Civic Data Trust. And I must note, you know, Pam being from Toronto, I'm sure she's very familiar with the Sidewalk Labs project that Alphabet had there. They originally proposed a governance model that was somewhat styled on a Civic Data Trust, but they backed away from it. And ultimately, of course, that project uh, went away. Um, but in both cases, it's the idea of entities collecting data from individuals in and then particularly with the Civic Data Trust in an actual environment context. And there's a paper there you can look up online if you want to know more information about that. There's just why digital fiduciaries. I think there's lots of great reasons on the user side. I think for companies, I think there are, there are ways that they can get benefit, even for policymakers. I think having fiduciaries and, and creating these and, and blessing, recognizing fiduciary relationships can actually be a better remedy for things like data protection, for example. And you know, Don mentioned up front, privacy is something people talk about. Everybody has different views on that. We try to legislate to these standards, but it's difficult right, to do that. Why not let people decide what data protection schemes and privacy schemes they want to have in place vis-a-vis -vis relationships with third-party entities like a digital fiduciary? That could be arranged to serve the unique purposes, the context of that individual as opposed to a one size fits all, which I think is it's much more problematic. So why public libraries? I think you all, have, in my honest opinion, have potentially an amazing role to play here in a number of ways. And, and this just, uh, to me, this, these are just a few things I sketched out um, last night. Why I think libraries could serve this, this particular role in society. It's a special place of trust that you already have today. It already exists. It's not something to be rebuilt or reshaped. You already are in the information business. You do information, what I call fluency. Uh, you curate things. I wrote a paper five years ago on digital preservation at the urging of my colleague at Google, Vint Cerf, um, and learned some great things about what libraries and other institutions are doing to try to protect against so-called bit rot. And then of course, dissemination, the educational side of it. You're also already anchor institutions and, and Don knows full well the work you're doing on the broadband front. You're trying to bring more broadband and internet connectivity into the libraries uh, this could be another way of anchoring, uh, I'm sorry, of, of taking advantage of and utilizing that connectivity. You already owe fiduciary-like duties to your patrons. Um, you may not think of it that way, um, but I certainly do. And I remember after 9-11, when the NSA started knocking on the doors of public libraries asking for access to the records, um, the libraries said, sorry, we don't do that. Um, that's not the way we, we do things. We keep confidences around um, the lists, for example, of, of, of what people check out. From the libraries. It's also already the center point of civic activity for many communities. So all of this together suggests to me that there's a there's a role here, what I would call sort of a almost a public option for creating this digital fiduciary type arrangement uh, that opens up these new vistas. And importantly, it doesn't have to be the specific kind that I mentioned. It could be one where you serve as an entity that's a fiduciary to individuals, but it could also be a communal collective approach where you are acting more as a pooling resource for your local community or a mix of the two. So I think there's many, many ways to go there. And then finally, I'll just touch on the AI side of it because this is the second piece. The first piece was human governance. The second piece is the cool technology. And so many of you are, recall um, uh, Tony Stark and Iron Man with his Jarvis inside his exoskeleton helmet doing all these amazing things for him. Um, that's what I would consider what I call a personal AI. So that's a, an example of a kind of technology where we're taking what's, what's really available out there today and we're moving it to the edge of the network where the individual is to serve their personal needs. Um, so the personal AI would really sort of reforming, as I say, reforming institutional AIs, making them less biased, for example, in what they do, hugely necessary, important work. I'm not trying to demean any of that, but I feel like at the end of the day, again, it's incomplete. We're trying to make them do the right things. I think an approach that is complementary is to give us the tools that we can then harness to our agency and to empower us. And so a personal AI could take this on. There's a project at Stanford University called Project Almond 
that proof of concept is already underway. There's also interoperability standards being developed at the IEEE Working Group 7006. And so this combination of a digital fiduciary plus the personal AI representing the interests of the individual working together, I think can create a truly empowering human-centric combination at the edge of the network. So finally, in conclusion here, it was 50 years, almost 50 years ago now that, that Vince Cerf, my, my former colleague at Google, and Bob Kahn released their seminal TCP IP paper where that end-to-end -end protocol um, concept first arose. I think we're now heading into the 50 year anniversary. I think we are, we are long past due time to, to really take that amazing seminal work and try to improve on it as best we can with a new kind of overlay to the web where we have a paradigm that, that serves our interests, including governance principles and design principles that serve the edge of the network. So the call to action here, I think the time is ripe. Let's, let's start building something amazing. I, I've been a huge admirer of the library community for a long time and I would welcome the chance to talk further with you. There's my email address, richardglia.net. Glia.net is the website, so you'll find out more information there uh, based on my project. And uh, at that point, I'll hand it, hand it back to you, Don. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Richard. Um, I think you did a great setup for a whole session. <laughs> I'd like to actually uh, set up, you know, uh, pull together a group to act as a focus group and have you go back through those individual elements and we and we take them on kind of one by one in an interactive way and have people like Pamela and, and David and and Todd seems to have spent a lot of time looking at this issue kind of go you know what are, what are the implications of all these different things and how do they then kind of go go further and importantly how can those manifest as new library roles tangible actions that libraries can take in this really, really important, overwhelmingly important topic. Um, you, you mentioned the kind of the evolution, you tracked sort of the evolution of, of the internet. So the web arrived, you know, sitting on top of this architecture, you mentioned end to end thing. And then yeah. you can all imagine that picture of the web, right? There's just, there's no center to it. But over the last 25 years, it seemed like there's been a center aggregating in that architecture around the platforms. They have seized, so it looks more like a star network now where we yes. all connect to each other through the middle, through these, through these not trusted intermediaries, but these powerful intermediaries that, that there's no way around it. I mean, how can I actually connect directly to another user? Uh, yeah, a walkie talkie? Yeah, so uh, having all that data and communication flow through these central points is, I think, what has given rise to the opportunity that they have that they can't resist because they're optimized, their corporations optimizing profit and, and, uh, and building algorithms that do that automatically and play on our, what this struck me about the, the social dilemma, that, that they play on our passions. So everybody's passionate about something, you know, socks or uh, uh, Confederate flags or horses, you know, whatever. And, and so because we have that, those are the things, those constitute our behavior online that build up our profile that then in turn are fed and causing us all to sort of drift apart as, you know, and, and, and in, in the political application, it, it's creates this an amazing disconnect people just cannot even talk to each other they, they no longer have a common frame of reference and this is not sustainable so how we can hack that uh is absolutely fantastic work and and i i thank you personally in behalf of everybody else for your leadership in this area i think it's just tremendously important you know uh, uh, over and above just kind of awareness and some steps to protect ourselves we have to have a systemic response to this uh, rather than just individual. So we will definitely set that up, Richard, and, and, and go back through and, and look at uh, the different points on that. Uh, we're just at our hour here now. Uh, any, any questions people have for any of our speakers, uh, uh, weigh in on the chat. Uh, this is a lot of stuff in the chat. <laughs> We'll, we'll capitulate, recapitulate this. Uh, Richard, your, your slides, uh, and for Pam as well, I ask you in the chat, is there, 
Is there a link that we always have requests for slides? Is can you offer us links to your slides, or we'll we'll just let people go back and watch the video? Happy to provide a link, or I could just I mean, mine is a Google Google Slides. I can just download it as a PDF if you want to distribute it to the list on. Or well, that's you... a difficult thing. If you'll if you'll post the link itself right there in the chat, then people will have it. Pam, okay. if you can do that, or if it's not convenient, it's okay. Uh, but uh, you know, we cover so much ground so quickly. My head is spinning. And I've been going to kind of preparing for this. So I know everybody else is, you know, likes to review these things as they can. They are recorded and they are archived on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. Uh, and we're in the process of, uh, uh, of converting all those to uh, YouTube format so that we can run them through the translator and the transcription services create closed caption uh, and post them in uh, half a dozen different languages. Uh, we think this is valuable material. Uh, it also, besides the individual topics, the sequence just tracks through the, the history of the pandemic and how libraries have been interacting with it. So there's, there's something of a story there as well as all these components. So I'm looking to see if anybody has questions before we bring the formal recorded session to a close. Uh, Rose had a question about a paper. I don't know if I answered that, Rose. Maybe so. But uh, uh, David, uh, uh, a last word here. You muted, you're not muted. There you go. There Last go. word is pay attention to which light is green and red on your microphone. No. <laughs> uh, this is a great primer and you're right, your head is gonna swim as you dive into this. Um, the work that Pamela is doing in terms of clarifying this and I love the hands-on stuff she's doing with the community and, and getting informed of this is, is valuable. Um, we have a, a role to play advocating with and uh, on behalf of our communities. And so I would say, uh, dive in and you've got a couple of starters. Thank you. Thank you, David, for you know, the really important setup that you gave us for this session today. Pam, a last word. Uh, thanks, everyone. I, I really enjoyed uh, the sessions. It's always interesting when you see what's going to be happening in the session and thinking, huh, I wonder how those are going to tie together. But it <laughs> seemed it seemed to go very well. Uh, so i um, happy, happy to, to know about uh, these sessions and uh, Happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to follow up with, with me. Afterwards right. Thanks, well. thanks for putting up your link there and, and people can uh, follow up directly with you for, for your session. And uh, would you be interested in, in helping us form a, 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 a like a focus group that we could, you know, grill Richard in, in detail and, and try to pin him down on, on these grand ideas? <laughs> Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the sidewalk model. We were very involved with that. I was one of the experts on the community panel that was dealing with public realm. Um, and then of course, when it was floated about the Civic Data Trust, very involved in, I don't know, I had like crazy media day, one day when that broke from like everybody all over the world <laughs> with, tell me about your Civic Data Trust. It's like, well, we don't actually have one. Uh, so exactly. uh, yeah, yeah. We, we went through a lot on that. So I'm happy to happy to talk about that. Good, good. I had left Google at that point, but I was very familiar with some of the internal machinations. And it was it was very disappointing to me because they took a concept that I think has an immense possibility to it and they just messed it up. <laughs> right? It was a well, gloss perfect. on top of their own sort of top-down thinking and just did not do justice to I think the interesting concepts behind it. Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Uh, I, at this point I'd like to every ask everyone to unmute. Unmute, please, everyone because uh, if we were live together in an auditorium, at this point, we would be thanking our speakers with a round of applause. And I'd like to do that now, everybody, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Ah, great, that was wonderful. Okay, well, this closes our recorded portion of the session. Thank you all, come back next week. We've got, uh, uh, we actually have SpaceX coming on next week. We're gonna talk about a new infrastructure. It'll be really interesting and how they might work with libraries. So uh, thank you all for coming and come back next week.